All right, welcome in Cube Show Podcast, a college football podcast usually comes to you on Sundays, but because of the UFL getting going this weekend, we're going to go on Saturday. So today is Saturday, UFL kicks off today. We'll actually reference it a little bit with one of the things that I want to talk about from a college football perspective today. Uh, but also, uh, you got a lot of your college stars that you've enjoyed for a long time now going to be playing in the UFL. So I'll be on DC at San Antonio, 11 o'clock ESPN Sunday. Happy Easter. And obviously be able to roll through that the entire season. So we'll have to move the schedules around a little bit every now and then. Uh, but I wanted to go ahead and get this one knocked out. Dual spring football preview as we've been doing. Every SEC team, we're going to roll through them. Uh, we got Ole Miss for you today. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with this group. There's a lot of reasons to be excited about this group. And then something that happened in an Ole Miss press conference this week that's going to happen to college football Really a topic of conversation that I kind of want to hit as to what it's going to be like, how it's going to work, what are we going to do with it, and that is the communication that's going to change with one of the rule changes coming this season in college football. So we'll get to all of that and more. Appreciate all of you last week. I do want to say one thing. There are a lot of comments in last week's show. I wasn't able to really respond to all of them. I do appreciate the comments. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Again, we're closing in on 10,000 subs on YouTube. Please subscribe right now if you're tuned in there. Um, you guys talking about the snaps and having anything to do with one or the other, uh, be it Milrow or McLaughlin, just know this. When, when I reference things like that last week, I don't guess on this stuff. I just don't. Okay, if it's my opinion and I don't know and I'm just telling you what I think, I'll make that very clear to you. And I did not do that last week. So take that for what you will. We're always brought to you by our friends at Wickles Pickles. You know, wickedly delicious. Go to wickles.com. You can pick up a jar there. Boom. We've always got them around the house. We love snacking on them. They are wonderful. Wickles, title sponsor of the show. And we appreciate what they do for us and appreciate them being part of Cube Show each and every week. Please support them. All right. So Lane Kiffin in his press conference this week after practice one day was asked about this helmet communication that is going to be going in this year in college football. And one of the reasons that I just referenced that in the UFL is you're going to be able to listen in to some of that communication during the broadcast. So you'll hear the defensive coordinator communicating with some guys on defense. You'll hear the offensive coordinator communicating with players on offense. Now, last year, they're going to cut the microphones down a little bit here, so there'll be fewer. I think they're going from eight to six. But you had teams on offense that would have quarterback and all his receivers had it in their helmets. So you imagine how much easier things could be with that line of communication to be able to change things like, boom, right on the go. And – it went all the way up to the snap, which was something that I think could also be a headache, could be troublesome, bothersome, but also could be very valuable. Uh, so we'll talk about it a little bit, but this is what Lane had to say earlier this week just on the helmet communication going in this year in college football. So it was an option in the, in the bowl season. I think they're kind of talking about it more. Just your thoughts on would y'all enact the communication between coach and the quarterback in the helmets? Yeah, I've been part of those conversations for a long time, you know, in SC meetings, and they're usually defensive head coach driven about, hey, we need to have our middle linebacker like the NFL have this, and then people can stop see stealing our signals. So it's here, and, you know, we utilize it in practice and our first time getting used to it. <clears throat> I, I, I think differently, especially after using it. I think it's really like having a cheat code in Madden offensively. And I don't know that they've really thought defensively of what exactly that means. I think the assumption is just, oh, you talk to the quarterback. But there's really more to it than that, especially the way we run our offense. So without giving too much in that of what it allows us to do with signals, with the whole process, I think it's a cheat code offensively if you do certain things offensively. So... Um, Defenses coaches always wanted it, so it's it's here. All right, interesting comments there from Lane Kiffin. I mean, a cheat code in Madden is basically what he's warning these defensive coordinators that he now has. Here's what's really interesting about this: we had Ole Miss a couple of times last year, obviously, for some of you, and. When we sat down with Lane, this came up at one point in time, mainly because of all the Michigan stuff that was going on in that situation and kind of how he would handle it, what he does differently to avoid it. And the helmet communication thing came up. Basically, we said, is this coming at some point in time? 
And he said, I'm one of the only ones at all these meetings every year that doesn't vote for it, that votes against it. And we couldn't believe it because you just figure all the offensive guys want it to make the adjustments, make the changes, talk to different guys, like look at this route, look at the coverage, whatever that is, watch this pressure. But he said that he would be willing to sacrifice the advantage it would give him so the defenses wouldn't be able to have it. And he said because defenses are so responsive that he knew that that later communication that they might be able to get before a snap would be valuable enough to offset some of the things that he had already done. I think essentially what he's saying there is I have enough confidence in how my scheme has been designed either pre-snap or pre-game that you're just not going to be able to match it. And that communication might help you a little bit more. But he also knows if he's able to see how guys are aligned and what the coverage is most likely going to be or where pressure might be coming from, or if he's going to get a different matchup than what it looks like on the field, and he can communicate that later in the process, he knows how valuable that's going to be. Uh, now, again, like I said, you're going to be able to listen to some of this in the UFL. Uh, watch San Antonio. A.J. Smith, their offensive coordinator, he is a, uh, he's a June Jones protege, so he's more run and shoot. But there are principles of that in a lot of offenses in college football. Ole Miss is going to carry a little bit of it. Uh, Tennessee is going to carry a lot of it. So if you want to watch that and kind of get an idea of how that's going to work, that'll give you a little bit of a feel for it. Um, you know, you're going to have a couple of teams like Mississippi State is going to be a lot of that this year. It'll give you a good idea of just kind of the communication, the calls, certain things like that. Now, they're easy, simple calls. And Lane does have a lot of that. Uh, his language is not overly wordy, even though he has a lot of the West Coast background. Uh, in his upbringing, but him being able to communicate is going to be a big advantage. Who has the bigger advantage, though? Like, who wins in this situation? McElroy and I talked about this on the radio show earlier this week, and he thinks that defense wins just because of the little bit of information they're now going to be able to have. It becomes that much more valuable. So, when a defense lines up, and, and again, when you see when you hear these defensive coordinators, I can't tell you guys how many times during the season we get defensive coordinators facing tempo that say, we just want to get our cleats in the ground. We just want to get lined up. Like I can remember talking to Will Muschamp vividly about this, and he was like, guys, alignment, assignment, effort. You give me those three things, and we're going to be good. Line up correctly. Know what your assignment is on the play. Even if you kind of get beat or you don't just work a guy over, if you're going to the correct place, it gives the rest of our group a pretty good chance to make a stop. And then just give me great effort. I mean, a lot of defense can be won with great effort. But also, you can take yourself out of place with great effort. If your assignment's off, I mean, why do bootlegs work? Why does the RPO game exist? You know, why does zone read work? Because you use guys' effort against them, and it gives you more that opens up for you inside of your offense. So is all that going to change because of this communication? No. But I do think where the advantages lie with defense is identification, number one. So what's the personnel grouping going to be? This is going to save a visual trip back over to the sideline for guys to look and see what that call is going to be if they need it from the sideline. If there's a guy that they're attempting to ID and they don't know if they identify him as a receiver, as a tight end or a running back or a slot, then all of a sudden now this can be settled in a hurry. And that's something else. That's a little bit more communication that can now be eased as far as once you get to the snap. Uh, how to roll coverage, when not to roll coverage, when to change a coverage. I mean, that kind of stuff is going to be helpful. But also keep in mind defensively that information still has to be shared with everybody else. Now, that could be a, you know, a quick hand signal, something. It, it could be pretty easy, but it still does have to be passed on to everybody else. Offensively, I think more times than not, a very minor adjustment pre-snap can give you the advantage. Now, I believe this is going to go off at 15 seconds before the snap. So what I would anticipate you see is probably less snaps going down to the wire. And even when guys are going to go fast, you'll probably take it down closer to that number instead of snapping it with 19, 18 seconds left because you want to get as much communication in as possible. How this goes a little bit further, though, is something that I, I wonder about and something I'm curious about. Like, how does this affect the overall game? Um, the advantages will offset themselves a little bit as far as defenders being able to see things from a different vantage point, being able to look at things from a different way. Like when you listen to San Antonio, you'll hear A.J. Smith this year in the UFL. He'll say, throw the slant, throw the slant, throw the post, post is open, post is open. Or he'll say, if the coverage changes, he'll be like, going back to cover one, going back to cover one. Like he'll tell them this stuff right away. 
How many quarterbacks are going to be able to handle it, though? I mean, they're not, there's not going to be a ton of reps with it. And is that going to – guys that tense up a little bit and don't have that extreme calm in the pocket or at the line of scrimmage, does it make them tense up even more now trying to have this communication with their offensive coordinator? It's something that you have to think about just because these guys hadn't done a lot of it and they don't really have a true understanding of it. How many coaches are going to panic trying to get the perfect call in instead of just saying, run inside zone? Uh, so I, I, it's going to be a little bit of a give and take early. I'm very interested to hear some of the conversations about how it's going, if there are real complications with it. But the sign stealing stuff's going to go away. And I think that's a good thing for football, something these guys aren't going to have to worry about. But going a little bit further, I do also wonder if we start to talk about just the development of college football players and is this something that's going to hamper them a little bit more? Now, don't get me wrong. It's not the job of college football coaches to prepare kids for the NFL. That can be an added advantage. That can be something that's used in recruiting. It can obviously be something that a system that somebody plays in has a better chance for that to equate to NFL success. They're going to want that. Yeah, sure. But it's not ultimately the job of a college head coach to say, we are going to get you ready for what's going to happen in the NFL. Their job is to win games. And if it's not something that often happens in the NFL or technically, fundamentally, it's done a different way, then they're not going to go teach it that way if it helps them win more games in a better fashion. So that part of it's just not real. Is there going to be less meeting time? If a lot of these coaches now think that they've got it and they can handle it and they're going to put more of the onus of changing things on themselves as opposed to their quarterback or their center or anybody else that's out there, do you just spend more time on the practice field? Do you try to go have more walkthroughs and get more mental visual reps with people actually in front of you when you're actually lined up? I mean, there's three types of learners. Audio, visual, kinesthetic. And most football players are kinesthetic learners. That's why you hear coaches walking through all the time. There's not a lot of guys where you can go to the whiteboard. I was one of these that couldn't do this. Draw a defense, draw a play, and say, tell me how you were going to block it. Uh, it took me longer, and I had to see it different ways to be able to understand it. Uh, and a lot of guys can't just listen to somebody say, hey, when a receiver does this, you do this. Or when we roll this coverage this way and he breaks inside, you go take this area of the field and then go out and apply it. Usually you have to physically rep it for it to be applied correctly. So is this going to change things from how much guys meet? Do they meet less? Do they walk through more? Do they practice more? Do they just try to go emphasize the reps more so? So when they do get to the game and the coach gets them to the exact right thing, then they can just go out and run it to the best of their ability. So I, I don't know the answer to some of these questions. I think it's going to be very interesting to watch. But I did want to give you guys a little bit of a heads up that You'll be able to hear some of this and how it sounds when you watch UFL games. And it's going to be interesting to just kind of get that feeling of certain coaches that instead of just getting the play call in, try to walk guys through it. Now, this will go a little bit longer than college will, but it'll give you a different idea of just how it operates and how it works and give you a feel for when you're watching it in college football and you see the quarterback with his hands over his ears, what's taking place just a little bit. Also, I think you'll get more coordinators on the field is another thing that I think will happen from this. So I think you'll see more coordinators. A.J. Smith was one of us when we met with him this week. He said, I'll be on the field now. He said, because uh, the tablets are going to come in college football as well. They'll have those. He said, now that I have the tablet and I can walk over with my guy and show him different things, I don't, and I can go look at that, I don't need to see it in a different way. So uh, I think with tablets and that communication through the helmets, Maybe more coordinators are on the field than in the booth because that view doesn't become as valuable or maybe loses a little bit of value or because you had that communication, you'll just trust somebody else to give it to you and let you know what they're seeing. A lot of things could change because of this that aren't just coordinator being able to send play into quarterback. It's going to be fun to watch this year. And Ole Miss will be one of the teams that's most fun to watch. I'll tell you about Blue Delta Jeans before I tell you about Ole Miss because you can stop by and see them right there in Oxford, Mississippi. Nick and the guys will take great care of you. Go to BlueDeltaJeans.com if you can't make it over. You can now be digitally fit for custom denim, custom jeans. And let me tell you, they are amazing. I love my Blue Delta Jeans. You can go get some for yourself. You've got Father's Day, Mother's Day coming up, birthdays, Easter, whatever it is. Blue Delta Jeans gift card. You can get that for somebody and a loved one in your home and let them go get a pair of jeans for themselves. All different colors, all different styles. Go check them out for yourself. Dress them up, dress them down casual, but they're stretchy, they're breathable, and they're going to fit you and fit your body type, which is incredible. BlueDeltaJeans.com. All right, let's roll in Ole Miss here. We'll talk a little bit about what this football team is going to be because I think there's a lot of things, as we just talked about from that communication standpoint. I mean, hell, let's just start with defense. Pete Golding 
and Wesley neighbors, they, they run a complex defense. There's a lot of communication that needs to happen. Uh, there's going to be big advantages there, especially with some of the transfers that are coming into where they play. So uh, we're going to focus on Lane Kiffin and offense and change of plays. It's going to be great for Pete too. So, and you got a, a lot of guys that are going to be back in that defense, a couple of new pieces we're going to talk about, but don't think that that's not going to be huge for what he's going to be able to do now in game, having a little bit of discourse with his players while they're on the field, looking at a formation or a personnel grouping and maybe be able to wipe a little bit of the confusion away before a football is snapped. But offensively, I don't need to tell any of you guys that this has a chance to be one of the better offenses we've seen maybe in SEC history. And I don't say that lightly. I don't just throw that around. But you're talking about a quarterback in Jackson Dart that had 3,364 passing yards, 23 touchdowns of five picks last year. He completed 65% of his passes. Now, if you listen to this show, we told you it was Jackson Dart the whole way through. A lot of other people wanted you to believe that that was going to go into the season with Spencer Sanders in a couple of games. No. They gave him a certain set of things last offseason he needed to improve upon, and he went and did those things on his own. He was pretty much the guy all through spring practice, but he went and took that job as well. I give Jackson Dart a lot of credit for that. It's one of the reasons I think he has a chance to lead this offense to some places that not a lot of SEC offenses have ever been. The versatility is going to be key, and it is going to be lethal. When you look at the targets that Jackson Dart's going to have, and keep in mind, he's a run threat also. He can break you down with his legs. He's physical enough to take a little bit of the punishment. Now, you don't want to do it 25, 30 times a game. You're not going to run, live on quarterback inside zone. But he can give you some of that. Also, I think, too, you know, he has a little bit of elusiveness in the pocket to be able to avoid the rush and turn negative plays into positive plays. All, again, things that make Jackson Dark one of the better quarterbacks in college football that's returning this year. We know what Trey Harris is. I take transfer, big, physical, can go get the 50-50 balls, can win one-on-ones. I mean, he is going to be your receiver that when you get matchups on the outside, you're going to throw those back shoulders. You're going to take those shots down the field because – 54 catches, 985 yards, eight touchdowns last year, and he was dinged up for portions of the year. He's set to have a massive year. I'm told he's having a great spring. I'm told he's being challenged a little bit more by certain guys on the other side of the football, and that's only making them all better. And Trey Harris looks like he is ready to roll this upcoming season. You'll get Jordan Watkins back, a guy who can work the middle of the field, works the slot a little bit more. He had 741 and three touchdowns last year. Aiden Williams was the freshman last year that everybody was excited about, but just kind of couldn't get him going. Couldn't find his way into the lineup very much. But when you hear about athletically what he does, being extremely gifted in the red zone and attacking the football and high pointing the football, he's a guy that might have a, even if he can't be a regular piece of the rotation as much as, say, Trey Harris, Jordan Watkins will be, he can be a guy that situationally can give you something a little bit different. And then Caden Lee apparently is blowing it up this spring, having a hell of a spring, uh, doing some really good things. He had five for 114 and two touchdowns last year, and he could just be another piece offensively that gives Jackson Dart different options on where to throw the football. Now let's bring in Juice Wells, who's not going to go through spring, finally getting that foot repaired that was an issue for him most of last year. I thought he was the best receiver going into the season last year in the SEC. Now, I think Malik Neighbors, regardless of what he'd done, probably would have still passed him. But you've got one of the more talented wide receivers in college football that's going to be lining up opposite Trey Harris. And Juice Wells can be a move guy. He can work the slot. He can work outside. Whether it's one-on-ones down the field, catching the ball in traffic, catch and run, he can be good at. Two years ago, 68 for 9, 28, and 6 touchdowns. Like, the guy is dynamic. He is special. He's a special worker. Coach Beamer told me that uh, after he transferred in from JMU, about a month into it, he had to go to him and say, hey, man, I brought you in to challenge our other receivers, but like maybe take like hit the brakes just a little bit because he was challenging everybody else in that facility so much. He's uber competitive and a guy that just wants to go be great. So I think when you put him on the field with Trey Harris and Jordan Watkins, watch out. I don't know how you cover it. And then to that extent, also guys you're going to have to worry about covering is going to be this tight end group. Like Caden Priestcorn is your – prototypical every down, every system tight end. Like he can do it all. He can put his hand in that date. He can line up next to an offensive tackle. He can go out there and blow people off the ball. He's got pretty good speed, straight line. He understands how to work his routes and get open. He's got good ball skills. We saw him in the bowl game. He was dynamic. He had a great, had a great bowl game. But Caden Priestcorn is kind of your do-it-all tight end and a super valuable piece to what this offense is and can be. And again, you go back to the portions of the levy Baylor offense that Lane has brought in with Charlie Weiss Jr. The tight end is critical to be able to run things that way because of matchups. Now you get Daquan right in for Virginia Tech. 
47 for 574 in his career at Virginia Tech in two years, 6'4", 250, still another pretty physical tight end. I mean, from what I'm told and what he's done, he's having a pretty good spring as well. And then you've got Javante Connor, who we haven't even mentioned, that also has shown that he can be one of the more physical tight ends on this roster. Put Hudson Wolf in there, a taller, a little bit leaner pass catcher of a tight end with Dylan Hip. You got good numbers in that room. Depth has been an issue for Lane in this offense at certain points in times in his career at Ole Miss. It will not be an issue this year. You've got a big time group of tight ends that's going to allow you to line up in different formations. We talk about the screen game with tight ends on both sides of the field. What you're going to be able to do there if you split them out, you can compress them in, and all of a sudden now. If you go single back and two tight ends, you widen your surface and it opens up your rush lanes just a little bit more. Also, it shows a bigger formation that guys have to compress down close to the football in the line of scrimmage. They can open up things on the perimeter for Trey Harris and Juice Wells to be able to throw the football. All that being said, then you get Ulysses Bentley back at running back, who is a dynamo, a spark plug, a speedster with power, has over 2,100 yards and 23 rushing touchdowns in his career uh, on 384 attempts, by the way. 53 catches in his career. You thought you were going to have Logan Diggs with him to sort of go thunder and lightning. Diggs with the knee issue. Don't know when he's going to be able to get back this year, but if he is back at any point in time, he's going to be valuable. I'm a big fan of his work. Loves him at Notre Dame. Really liked him at LSU. Look at the receivers and quarterback they had last year. They just couldn't use him a ton. But I'm telling you, downhill, Logan Diggs can be a load, which opens the door to potentially get another back in in the spring portal window. Does it happen? Henry Parrish, a name everybody's throwing around? Possibly. But honestly, running back depth needs to come back, and I think Lane wants it to come back. But with all the other weapons that you have and how Lane has used receivers in the backfield before and then motioned them out a lot of the times, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think if the running back depth doesn't improve, it's going to cost him a game or two. I'm just not that concerned about it. I'm really not. But the group that could take this team to the complete next level that could make this a totally different deal for what Ole Miss is in 2024 is the offensive line. Uh, We've talked about a couple of these transfers in previous episodes. Diego Pounds comes in from North Carolina. He's massive, big, physical, pretty good movement, good feet, misses with his punch a lot, a little bit of a waist bender, kind of gets overextended. Then you go get Julius Below from Washington, a guy that I think could help at tackle. I think he's repping tackle and guard in the spring. Pretty athletic, a little bit lighter, not overly physical, but a guy that has a a little bit of a different skill set and played on the Joe Moore Award-winning offensive line last year. Next to Nate Kaleppo, who's working at left guard, who is going to be a road grader, is a road grader, was a road grader at Washington. He's an upgrade from almost everybody that was on this offensive line a year ago in hell for the last couple of years. He's a really good football player. This is a massive get for Ole Miss. Of course, you've got Caleb Warren coming back at center. Uh, Jerquan Scott from Southern Miss, my understanding is that he's having an excellent spring. And he could have a potential run at one of these two guard spots for Ole Miss this upcoming fall. Uh, Eli Acker's back, a guy that's played all three of your middle spots. Super valuable because he can back up three different positions and he's got a ton of reps under his belt. Jeremy James not having as good a spring, apparently, as some of the other guys that we've mentioned. Micah Pettis is out for the spring, but we've seen what he's able to do. Super talented. He's got some physicality. I like his game. The bottom line is the numbers with this offensive line are probably in a better spot than they've been. I'm just going to, since I can remember, you got eight, nine guys that have played significant snaps in real college football. Ole Miss just hasn't had that for a while. And Charlie Weiss Jr. showed you last year, they're not afraid to rotate some of these guys. I mean, Acker is somebody who would come in every now and then. They would roll different offensive linemen in because of the tempo and the pace and not want him to get worn down. But one thing that they didn't have, and Lane Kiffin specifically told us last year, was that little bit of extra oomph. That's why they didn't run inside zone as much last year as they wanted to. You get a couple of these guys in like Nate Kaleppo, maybe a Jerquan Scott, and possibly a Diego Pounds, and you can get a little bit of extra pop at the line of scrimmage, a little bit of extra power. Your offense is different, and people have to defend you in a very different way. Linebackers are closer to the line of scrimmage. There are more players in the box trying to take the run game away, and even when you add quarterback run to that, that's already probably going to be there anyway. Um, The bottom line here is, with everything that we talk about, all the different receiving targets, experienced quarterback that has legs that can break you down, tight ends that can flex out, give you all the different options from a formation standpoint and a movement standpoint with motions, the ability to run tempo, experience in the offense, overall experience. I don't know how you defend it. 
And you may have pretty good quarterback depth with, say, a Walker Howard, who's probably ready to go. You hope you don't need that, but he probably should be. We know he's got big time talent. Austin Simmons will compete for the backup job as well. So I just don't know where you're going to focus in and stop this offense. I really don't. Unless you're able to do it with two defensive linemen and a linebacker and take the runaway that way. It is going to be damn near impossible to slow down what this group is capable of in 2024. And the schedule is beyond favorable. Uh, I don't see a reason they shouldn't be undefeated when they go to LSU in the middle of the year. Uh, Maybe Kentucky can be a little bit tricky before that. But it is a pretty light load before they get to midseason and travel to Baton Rouge. So that's the offensive side of it. The portion that also could help this team take a big step and maybe make a legitimate playoff run, not just into the playoffs, but through the playoffs is going to be what they have defensively. I mentioned the depth on that offensive line. I think in similar fashion, and it's even more past what I said going into last year, when I said, I think Ole Miss is bigger and badder up front than I can ever remember them being. Was there a Condici every now and then? Was there a Benito Jones every now and then? A Kendrick Clancy every now and then? But very rarely did you have three or four big physical interior defensive linemen on the Ole Miss roster that concerns you. You've got that now. J.J. Pegues is turning into a better defensive lineman, not just a freak athlete that people are asking to slant and stunt and do different things to be disruptive. He's learning how to strike and shed and use his hands and play his gaps. He's becoming a quality D lineman that has a ton of athleticism. You're going to get that with Walter Nolan. And if you can get his motor running on a regular basis and a more consistent basis, which I'm heard he's having a great spring, specifically against the run, so he's not just in there trying to get his pass rush reps in, all of a sudden you got some problems inside. You put that together with Xavier Harris, who played good ball last year. Joshua Harris is still there. Then you throw in an Aquilo Stone, who's a little bit undersized at 280-ish, but gives you that twitch and can be kind of a move guy inside for the Pete Golding defense. You got different options with different players that all can hold up in this conference in more numbers to be able to go do it. We just haven't seen this in a long time. I mean, Pegues three and a half sacks last year. Xavier Harris had a sack. Uh, Akilo Stone had two and a half sacks. Perkins on the edge had three and a half. Ivy had five and a half, and they're all back. Then out on the edge, yeah, Jared Ivy's back, and he's going to help. He's a quality player. Sunterian Perkins is going to be back three and a half sacks last year. I think he's got a chance to be a lot better than what people are talking about. Um, he's got a big time skill set, a big time motor. He's got real juice. He just needs to find a home and become comfortable in it to just focus in on going and playing some football. But now you add Princely Umalelin, and this young man brings a different skill set. I don't know another way to say it. Um, I mean, you can go back years in Ole Miss football, and I there haven't been many times that they've had a guy with this kind of twitch and this kind of bend off the edge. Like they just haven't had it. Uh, I mean, he's he's got legit speed. He's got legit burst. He's got big time flexibility. He understands how to be a pass rusher. And he's got just enough bulk to be able to hold up with it and be able to do it consistently and be in the game all the time. He was asked to do it a lot last year. He missed a lot of sacks. But I mean, you go to that Arkansas game last year, had a chance to close it out with a couple and couldn't. But he knows how to get to the quarterback. And he's going to have other players on this defense that also know how to get to the quarterback with him. And I think he makes this defense more problematic than anything else that they've added. But there are other pieces that have added that I love. Chris Paul Jr. at Arkansas, you talked to Travis Williams about this kid the last couple of years, raves about what he is in the locker room, raves about what he is in the meeting room. Very intelligent football player and productive football player. 74 tackles last year, 14 and a half tackles for loss over two years. The kid can play, man. And if his tandem linebacker with him last year at Arkansas, Jaheim Thomas, wasn't so tweaked up, He'd have probably had another 15 or 20 tackles. Thomas probably stole a bunch from him because he could move. And you put him next to TJ Dudley, who we saw in the bowl game, the Clemson transfer, who is 6'1", 230, and can run, run. You have two SEC-looking linebackers, like the way it's kind of supposed to be. So now physically, you're better built up front defensively. You're also better built behind them. So you don't have to just lean on your defensive line to subtract a ton of that physicality to allow your linebackers to be able to play. They're going to be able to hold up. They'll get off blocks. They'll get through blocks. They're going to be fine there. So I and the thing with TJ Dudley having a good spring from what I'm told, the freakiest guy on the team apparently. And think about some of these dudes we've talked about for somebody in that facility to say that about that young man. So and apparently can just absolutely move. 
I'm expecting a big year out of him based on what I'm hearing and apparently having a good spring. You've also got Raymond Collins, Collins, Kari Coleman back. Kari Coleman's played a lot of football. So that's now your linebacker room is bolstered up a little bit more. But the thing that Pete Golding harped with us last year was got to get bigger at linebacker, got to get bigger in the secondary. We just don't have enough size. So what do you do? You go get a Marion Walker from Michigan at 6'3", 180 to play corner. And Trey Amos comes in from Alabama, the Louisiana Lafayette transfer, who apparently he and Trey Harris have been battling it out this spring. Two guys specifically that have been making one another better throughout the course of spring practice, which, I mean, listen, you don't expect those corners and receivers to go out there and buy each other flowers, you know, like kiss and make up all the time. But you love seeing it when you get a little extra work and a little bit extra battling and one-on-ones because they know it's only going to make each other better. That's what you love to hear about guys at that position. Speaking of flowers, our friends at Blakely, Blakely's Bouquets, uh, right here in Homewood, Alabama, if you need anything for Easter, if you have a wedding, uh, if unfortunately you have a death in the family, uh, if you, my Mother's Day is coming up, get your Mother's Day orders in now, by the way, 205-579-4900, 205-579-4500. Blakely's Bouquets will get you set. Everything you need for spring, they've got it all in. They've got a subscription service that's coming soon, so pay attention for that. You can stop by, you can call ahead, all of Shelby County, all of Jefferson County here in Central Alabama, they can help you with. 205 205- 579-4900 or go to blakelysbouquets.com. All right, so defensively, you have Yam Banks who comes in at safety from South Alabama. My understanding is he's showing out in the spring, and he'll give you a little more physical presence at 6'1-ish, around 210, 212. Uh, I've, I've talked to Kane Womack about him, uh, raved about his skill set and the kind of individual he is. So you get a little bit bigger back in on safety. Key Lawrence, a guy that's had a productive career, a lot of experience at safety that's now going to be there. Um, you got Lewis Moore from Indiana that's back there as well. Again, more experience. It's pretty apparent that Pete Golding wanted size and reps, and he went and got that at a lot of different spots. So Trey Amos, who if you saw him late, like SEC Championship game and beyond, when he had to play for Alabama last year, held up really well, did some really nice things, played great football, not afraid to play the run, good in coverage like a guy that physically can hold up and you're going to love having in one-on-ones, which will allow you to do pressure situation things that you're going to need to up front. If you got these linebackers that can do the things that people say they can do, why not use them in some pressure looks as well? This team has the makings of everything that you would ask for to be able to go out and have a special season. A, a fairly forgiving schedule, no SEC schedule is ever going to be easy. It's just not. It isn't. But what you wanted to hear in the spring Outside of the guys that weren't going, obviously Micah Pettis is not going, Juice Wells is not going, Bentley's not going. Um, you've also got you know the injury to Logan Diggs that was unfortunate. That would be one that would really kind of set me off the rim here. But all the other things that you want to hear, depth on the O-line, depth on the D-line, a lot of reps at those two positions, intelligence at quarterback, intelligence at inside linebacker, upgraded the size in the secondary, defensive linemen that can hold up against the run, and some that are twitchy enough to be disruptive at different points in time when you want to ask them to move. Options offensively, and that just doesn't mean hand it off or throw it, different guys to throw it to, different guys that can line up in different places and essentially be different kind of players in those spots when they line up either in line as a tight end or split out wide as a tight end, in the backfield or out wide, in the slot or out wide. Formations, movement, motions that they're going to have. A quarterback that's now got two years in this system that's going to be able to run it in an even more advanced way than he has. It should be a special season. There's no reason that it shouldn't be. And with some of the young men that are excelling, in the spring, like a Caden Lee, who could even then go further than people thought that he would, or a TJ Dudley at linebacker that could maybe even go further than people thought he would, or maybe even a, a Daquan Wright at tight end. Uh, maybe it's a Jerquan Scott, offensive guard from Southern Miss that's extending past where people thought he would. There are going to be more pieces that are even added into this team that people aren't talking about. It should be a special season. They have a chance to make a hell of a run. In this 2024 college football season, the first year with a 12-team playoff, I see no reason that Ole Miss is not in. I see no reason that they couldn't go get a game or two in that college football playoff. So they're going to be a matchup nightmare. They're going to be an absolute handful. I think the communication system helps them on both sides of the ball. It's going to help everybody. But I think in certain points, it can help this team even more so than it's going to help some of those other clubs. So appreciate you guys tuning in. Please like, subscribe, five-star rating. We always appreciate it. We're gunning for 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Please just go click the subscribe button right now. I love the comments. Leave the comments. I'm going to follow up one more time. The stuff that you guys were trying to tell me about Jalen Milrow that I did not know, I do not guess on these things. It is not what I think. 
Okay. That's all I'm going to say, but just know that for next time, which is going to be next week, another spring preview for a different SEC team right here on Cube Show.